Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Thanks so much for joining me here on the program. And today we're going to discuss five moments in the American past that will possibly inform the 2024 election. Looking like Biden versus Trump at this moment in time, but we will see. And my guest today is Daniel T. Miller. Dan Miller. He's a PhD. He runs Historical Solutions, LLC. And Dan has the coolest job. Dan, thanks so much for being here. Tell us, what do you do? Uh, Give us a little bit of your background and what is Historical Solutions, LLC? Chris, thank you very, very much. I appreciate uh, you being here and having me on. Yeah. Uh, As we overlook Monument Circle uh, and all all of the beauty that it represents. So I've been doing my thing since 2004, which is to help people um, understand and use history as a basis for their leadership growth, their leadership enrichment, and their leadership advancement. Uh, in some cases, that's individuals who work with me. In other cases, that's organizations or groups. And uh, it's it's a real blessing for me for me to uh, have that chance to introduce people into into history and into the past, which are two different things, by the way, history and past. Introduce them in a way they really haven't had done before. So. Um, I've been very blessed to to be able to sit here today for you, with you and and say that it's been, oh gosh, what's the math? Almost twenty years or something. Yeah, you have a cool story. You just woke up one day and said, "I don't want to be doing what I'm doing. I want to do history." And then you you charted your own path. That's exactly right. Talk a little bit about that decision and and jumping into that. I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you. We could have the rest of the day on that, and I don't want to bore you or anybody else. Right. I'm going to give you one question that I ask myself, and I have to say that uh, the days of this question being relevant to listeners are are fading quickly, more quickly than I would like to tell you, because here's the question. I asked myself the Peyton Manning question. What did I think that I was Peyton Manning at doing? And this is, I don't know, 01, 02, 03 that I'm asking myself this, along with a lot of prayer and reflection. So the Peyton Manning question for me is, and, you know, I don't think I'm cutting any new ground in saying that Peyton Manning is not exactly the world's greatest athlete. From that perspective, what made him a world-class first-in-line quarterback was his ability to prepare. He would be quarterback, eat, sleep, and drink quarterbacking and football 24 hours a day. So that's how I meant the Peyton Manning question. What would I eat, sleep, and drink 24 hours a day if I had nothing else that was true? And so for me, it was it was using history in a different way and in a new way. And that was the genesis in answering that question that way. That was the genesis of my company, Historical Solutions, LLC. Yeah. And so in brief, you work with people one-on-one. You also do a lot of speaking. I've seen you speak a couple times. I actually paid you to come and see the presentation I'm asking you to partially give for free today. I loved the concept of it. I love the concept of everything that you do, and uh, you've become a good friend over the last couple of years. And Absolutely. I'm very excited to introduce you to the audience and hope to have you back again. But the talk that you gave, um, I don't know if you want to introduce the river concept uh, or how much we will dive into that, because yeah, you, you really focus a lot on rivers and a, a, as kind of a metaphor. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, give me a second and I'll roll that out a little bit. Uh, I believe, and this isn't unique to me, but you know, time moves in one direction, and that's forward, ahead of where it was a second ago or a minute ago, just like the water in a river. Now, now that water in a river is a, is a foot or a yard or 10 yards ahead of where it was just a brief time ago. Doesn't mean it's going in the same direction straight. Uh, it can twist and turn and all the rest, but the water itself is moving forward just like the time does in your life in your community's life, in the nation's life, and on and on. And so what I believe is that, like a river, there is no repetition. You have more than one rapids on a river. That's, that's a given. However, every rapids will look a little different. There'll be 80% of that rapids that is the same as the one you just passed a mile or so back. But there'll be 20% of it that's different and unique. And so I believe that history doesn't repeat, but history sure does rhyme, as Mark Twain is supposed to have said. So it's that rhyming, that 80 percent, 20 percent rhyming that I'm trying to help people understand as a way to enhance their leadership, both inside of their own personal lives, professional lives, and then just as citizens in the United States as well. Yeah, one of the things that I've been on about on this podcast, and our mutual friend Chris Bex came on and talked about it on a previous episode, is that once you start to learn history— and you start to understand that concept that you're talking about, 
things start to be less fearful. When you study Andrew Jackson, you fear Trump a little bit less, which is, you know, someone that we'll talk about today. When you talk about the uncertainty of the 1800 election, uh, which I think you did so eloquently in that talk, and we'll talk about that uh, first up here, things are a little less fearful. When you fully understand the past, or as best as you can ascertain, uh, that things don't have the same... Not every election, if, if we elect Democrats, I was reading this thing from someone from 2020 saying, you know, Joe Biden gets elected, my business is gone. Their, their business is still here. <laughs> right. You know, and I think it kind of takes the heat out of some of the media diet that we have these days. And, you know, your presentation and what we're going to talk about today are those five moments where there were rapids, where it wasn't placid. It was five moments in American history where that current was really active. Right. And, you know, let's start with the first one. First, how did you how did you come about five before we hop into 1800? But how did you come about these five moments in American history that may inform 2024? Great question. I, I tried to step back about 10 paces uh, and nobody's going to engage me, hire me, be with me, whatever words you want to use, if I just come at this from an an R and a D perspective, Republican and Democrat, they can get that anywhere of a thousand places, unfortunately, 24 hours a day of more or less uh, validity. So what I bring to it is is what I hope is a dispassionate and a disinterested take on parts of the past that are usable for what may be ahead whether it's politically, economically, militarily, what have you. So in taking 10 steps back, I'm looking for things that rhyme for now, right? And again, we're back to our 80-20. And I'm not looking for a mirror image of now because that does not exist. Right. So what's, what rises to the level of the 80-20? By the way, one thing, Chris, that's so important about the 80-20, and obviously those are arbitrary percentages on my part. It could be 75-25 for all I know. But... It's important to know that you can choose to focus on the 80% and ignore the 20%. In other words, focus on the continuity of the 80% and ignore the 20% change. Or you can flip it and focus on the 20% change and ignore the 80% continuity. Right. Either way, if you're going to isolate yourself on either side of that equation, you're doing yourself a tremendous disservice and you're being a lot less effective than you could be if you understood that change and continuity go together. Yeah, I mean, 2024, even if it's the same candidates, will look vastly different than 2020. That's exactly right. Let alone the 1800 election. So why don't Let's, you set up the 1800 election for us? And uh, first, just give us the background of what was going on, who was running, and then we'll get to talk about the stakes. Absolutely. So we're looking at the third. It's the third presidential election. Some people would argue, and I'd be one of them, that this really has the potential to undo or complete the American Revolution uh, because it's the first potential peaceful, potential peaceful transfer of power from one ruling group to another ruling group. Even if they share a lot of the same ideas, it's still a transfer from one group to another. Now, here's what we're talking about. We have George Washington and the Federalist Party. Washington dies in 1799 as president number one. P POTUS number two is his VP, John Adams, who's seeking re-election in his own right in the election of 1800. He's against, he's opposed by Thomas Jefferson, former Secretary of State, who had started kind of his own political party with James Madison calling themselves the Democratic Republicans. Um, and now they are formally and aggressively seeking the White House uh, on their own terms as a, as a presidential and vice presidential slate of nominees. So these two men, Jefferson versus Adams, are, yes, they represent different parts of the American Revolution. So in that sense, they were on the same side. However, like so many things today, they completely disagree about everything else. So, yeah, what's interesting, and just some background, I mean, 1776 is when the Declaration is signed. The Constitution is formed when? 1787. 1787 and enacted and ready to go. You're open for business by 1789 as the new constitutional government. Washington is president. Adams is his vice president. You know, a lot of the time uh, that the Constitution is being debated, Adams and Jefferson are overseas acting as delegates. But these two men were partners in 1776 in trying to cajole everyone into independence 
and realizing it doesn't matter if you, uh, John Dickinson, if you want to ask nicely, you're already in a revolution. Right. You already have to fight. And then we get to 1800, just a few short years later, 14 years later, and they are bitter rivals. Bitter rivals, personal rivals. They represent groups of people that are similarly personal and bitter rivals with one another on the other side of their respective aisles. And the insults are hurled left and right. Everything imaginable that's derogatory is said by one about the other. Doesn't mean there's no personal off limits. There's no personal boundaries. Uh, one of them is said to have fathered dozens of kids uh, on, among his enslaved population in Monticello. The other one is said to be essentially a closet George the Third wanting to bring monarchy back into the United States. And we could go on and on right. about the various accusations that are hurled against each other. So there's nothing probably more hurtful and painful than two friends that have fallen out over important topics. They know each other well. They know each other's little weaknesses. And uh, Adams, for his part, wasn't as active as Alexander Hamilton was for the Federalists. I think you can't talk about this moment without talking about the death of George Washington, how important Washington was, and then how big of a moment it was to lose Washington. Because in the country, there was a sense that, well, Washington's still alive. He's the thing that has kept us steady. And then you lose George Washington going into this first election, and it just causes tremendous anxiety Absolutely. within the population. Absolutely does. That's well said. And it's remember, it's seven, December, what, December of 1799, so you're about 11 months ahead of the election, more or less, that will occur the following year, the presidential election, that is. And it really feels like a cord having been cut. Uh, this is the father of the country. And remember that when you talk about the executive aspects, the executive articles in the Constitution, they are all debated and written and agreed upon with the knowledge that Washington will probably be the first one out of the gate. Yeah. So, so now the gate's closed. 100% of people, roughly. Uh, go into the presidency with him going into the presidency feels secure somewhat. That's exactly right. But now you get to 1800 and it's 50 50, and one side is going to win, and the other half of the country thinks that this is th this is a tyrant, this is a horrible person, this is a bad human That's being. That's exactly true. And remember the state, the issue stakes. The issue stakes are off the chart significant, off the chart fundamental. We're talking about a world war that's going on in Europe between pro-Napoleonic and anti-Napoleonic forces, which is seen as the light side versus the dark side. And on addition to that, you've got similar stakes domestically in terms of will, will the federal government grow? Can you imagine that in 1800? Will it grow too big, which is what Adams's group is supposed to want uh, and Jefferson's group is dead set against? And on top of that, there's this overlap between foreign and domestic, which is there's the belief that there are infiltrators. There's a there's a group of insurrectionists that, are, that have been transported into the United States by the pro Napoleonic sides. And they are they are on, on the verge of conducting sabotage against the standing government. So there's a there's a frenzy about the, the stakes involved. So this isn't just. You know, somebody wants to go left and the other wants to go right. There are there are fundamental survival issues on the table. And really, it's on the table that we need to talk about because how they managed to get through it. In other words, this dog eat dog backstabbing its backstab approach to the election of 1800 by Adams and Jefferson. How they get through that is that at the end of the day, they they all understand, yes, our survival is at stake. And fueling all of this is a new form of media a new approach to media because up to that point the enemy had been the british up to that point they had been united somewhat i mean there were obviously uh you know tories through the country that largely fled but you know you had debates but the 1800 election kind of feels much much different cool. this is this is uh this is post alien sedition acts post the, the jailing of Benjamin Franklin's grandson, I believe right. it was. And, exactly right. You know, and uh, the free speech wars that they had had at that particular point. But that new media that comes through in the 1800s is a new experience for them. It is a new experience, and they are essentially written versions of Fox News and MSNBC. Right. Uh, each party has one or more than one of these um, news organizations, if you will, that are devoted to the promotion of our guy and the destruction of their guy. And 
I'm not equating anything or, or anything like that, but, it, but the fact of the matter is it's, it's hardcore, it can be dirty, and you can get it for a dime at the corner, uh, at the corner town crier's stop. So it's new media in its biggest form. So you then go on to ask, you know, we managed to get through it. You know, there's stakes on the table. And basically, you know, which one of the three stands out at the rhyme? Pose the question to the audience to think about that. I will answer then that you did in your talk shop. So the question is, you've got, there are three things that get them through it. Number one is there's, there's this mutual understanding that all of our stakes are on the table. Number two is the belief that, you know what? the acceptable, the compromise is, is largely the, the doable that we're going to have to embrace. The compromise is what we're going to have to embrace. And number three, and this is critical, everybody can remember what they did 20 years before uh, in 1776, 77 and on during the Revolutionary War. Everybody who's, who's anybody in this fight can remember what I did and what my neighbor did and even what the guy who I don't like anymore did back in 76 77 and all the rest that collective memory of us having pulled through that 20 years ago that's a very very powerful impulse so those are your three reasons why we managed to get through it in 1800 yeah which i don't feel like we have connective tissue like that third one at this point you're right um you know all the stakes aren't necessarily on the table you've got a president who uh i know some people don't believe this but tried to overturn the election tried to subvert that peaceful transfer of power um, you know, the acceptable is the opposite of the unthinkable is something that you proposed in this. Mm -hmm. The concept of the unthinkable was what struck me in that conversation amongst the group that we had, because you have a group of people and then we have like a salon style discussion. It's a lot of fun. Um, people kind of took the acceptable, noble path of keeping the republic. Exactly. Instead right. of scuttling it for something that was unknown. And what I find interesting about this moment of time is that you have libertarians who are now monarchists who believe that Orban in Hungary is the model, right? You've got uh, progressives who obviously want to completely change and pervert the American Constitution. You've got Republicans who no longer really revere the Constitution. They're not talking the way that maybe Mike Pence and his generation of folks, and I, I believe in the Constitution and I want to uphold it. M Mike, you help write the Patriot Act, sit down. But, you know, the I think the there, there's a more of a willingness to dabble with the unthinkable than to just go along with the acceptable status quo of we're going to elect Biden or Trump, we'll get through it, at least the republic will preserve. D do you agree with that? I mean, you don't have to buy into my commentary if you don't want to, but uh, as an apathetic historian, but that's sort of how it feels to me is that concept of people are more willing to do the unthinkable now, or at least advocate for the unthinkable than maybe they were back then. I think you're right. And let me give you a human face onto this. Um, and again, just to remind everybody what Chris is, is uh, seizing on here is my, is my second point, quote, the acceptable is the opposite of the unthinkable, close quote. The human face of this, and we've all seen the musical, and I hope you've read the book that the musical is based on. The human face is Alexander Hamilton. Yeah. Remember, this is a disputed election in 1800. It's thrown into Congress, thrown into the House, and all the rest. And it's and Hamilton hates Jefferson. He's no real fan of Adams. So, but Hamilton realizes that he's going to have to work on behalf of the guy he really fundamentally hates, which is Thomas Jefferson, because he senses and he smells a bigger threat in the form of Aaron Burr. Yeah. And I think you fast forward a few years, and he's probably he's probably correct in that, uh, in terms of what Burr does as the vice president under Jefferson. So he says, he being Hamilton, I'm going to hold my nose, I'm going to do whatever, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to accept what I thought I didn't want to accept, which is I think Jefferson's a better pick than Aaron Burr. Jefferson will keep the revolution going. My sense, my smell, Hamilton says, tells me Burr will not. Yeah, because if we, uh, they literally could have scuttled the entire project then. Could have. We don't have that ability, right? Like you can have your people run into the Capitol on January 6th and democracy still endures because it's hard to break down those norms. Uh, but I, I think that is an interesting point is that they had the opportunity to do the unthinkable 
and they chose to continue as as a generation. Right. Uh, so let's move on to Andrew Jackson, which is number two. Oh, you got it. Uh, the more I read about Andrew Jackson, the more I hate the guy. I can't. <laughs> I I, uh, I have a friend who named his son after Andrew Jackson. I'm like. Why? As I've I've learned, every time I come across, I haven't studied Andrew Jackson, but every time I come across something involving Andrew Jackson, it's just horrible. Uh, I mean, who is Andrew Jackson? Why? uh, He really created a cult of personality. He did. uh, and, And was a remarkable figure. In American history, why did you focus in on Andrew Jackson? I've got I've got a whole a whole line of of sessions that I've done about Andrew Jackson uh, as the first Donald Trump, um, POTUS number seven as the first POTUS forty five, and I'm not a- I'm not going down this road because I have any particular dislike of of Jackson. Just so you know, I, that doesn't mean I think the guy's the greatest saint ever. But so I, again, dispassionate. I'm pulling back to try to be of the biggest value value to people. Uh, Jackson's the first Trump uh, because he's a he's a populist. He's a populist who's identified with a very particular kind of anti-elitist uh, posture that tends to be quite quite underlined, quite personal and personalized, and all of the rest uh, in its manifestation and expression. He doesn't see he doesn't see an issue against him. He sees people against him. Didn't, wasn't he like an orphan and then his brother was, raised him and his brother got killed and then he was sort of like uh, just very, uh, very rough childhood. Then. Very rough childhood, very, very direct and, and somewhat vindictive of a personality. Uh, he loved a lot and he hated a lot. Mm. Uh, and I think there's no middle ground on Andrew Jackson at all, basically starting from around 18, I'd say 18, 18 going Going forward, the reason I've got him on this particular Rapids from the River, the five moments from the American past for 2024, is the fact that he's a he's a three timer. He's a guy that runs for president three times. Unlike Trump, he loses the first time, wins the second time and then wins again the third time. So the first loss is in 1824 in what he thought was an absolute stolen election, corrupted election, dirty election. May have been. Uh, he's running up against John Quincy Adams. Uh, Adams allegedly probably made a deal with Henry Clay, who sure. was head of Congress. Congress then selects uh, John Quincy Adams, John Adams' uh, son, as the president. And he just completely thinks uh, that, you know, this was stolen from me. That's exactly right. And goes on to win in 28 bounces back from the loss, see, this is cru- this is crucial, and then goes on to win again in 1832 for his second and final term before there was a term limit on the presidency. Yeah. I will point out his success and his victory as POTUS continues on because his vice POTUS, Martin Van Buren, wins election uh, largely on the, uh, on the coattails and in the aftermath of Andrew Jackson's presidency. Martin Van Buren basically took the phenomenon of Andrew Jackson and turned it into... The modern political party, a marketable political commodity, uh, in that way. So the question would become for me: How did he? How did he, being Jackson, how did he bounce back from his loss? So we're 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 looking now at, at a potential presidential nominee in in Donald Trump bouncing back or not bouncing back in 2024. How did Jackson bounce back? Well, I'll tell you right now. There's there's one word to be perfectly honest. Well, there's probably two words about this. One would be the word cause, capital C, C C-A-U-S-E. He has a personal cause, and his personal cause is the American nation as he experienced it in the Revolutionary War. Now, there's a big difference between between the two of them. He had a personal experience of of war and combat and battle and all the rest that started in the Revolutionary War, continued on through various Native conflicts and into the War of 1812, where he has his apprentice show. His apprentice show, his version of The Apprentice, is the Battle of New Orleans. Yeah. Makes him a national household name. You don't have to know anything after 1815. And if somebody does a roar shock and puts up a silhouette of Andrew Jackson, you're going to nod and say, yeah, that's the dude that won New Orleans. Right. So basically slaughtered 2,000 British soldiers in New Orleans. With a ragtag group uh, that just included everybody you can imagine. So that's his apprentice. Uh, now, again... I'm not equating the two. It's fundamentally different, combat versus non. But Jackson has a personal cause that goes all the way down to the slash on the side of his face that a British officer 
put there with a sword when he was 13 years old during the Revolutionary War. So that's how he bounces back. He's got a capital C cause. The other thing that he's got is a religious belief that there is corruptionalism, and I'm making a word up here, right? There's corruptionalism afoot. Right. And it's everywhere you turn. It's in, under every rock you roll over. And it's under every defeat that may be threatening me, too, is there's got to be corruption there for me to be defeated. There's got to be corruption there for, uh, for an issue that I support to be overturned. And by the way, to give you an example, the bank, the Bank of the United States is one of his main issues in his first presidency and all the rest. And he, he says the bank is trying to kill me, but I'm going to kill it. And so the words I, I would put on there for you to emphasize, kill, number one, and me and it. Right. It's all very personal and very vindictive. Even when, I forget the exact example, but I was, I'm, I'm, was reading a book uh, called America. And it's about the Spanish settlements in uh, the Western Hemisphere. Tremendous book. Uh, Robert Goodings, I think, is the, the author's name. And he talks a little bit about Andrew Jackson. But Jackson is presented with irrefutable proof of an event that took place that he didn't like and still believe that it was all corrupted Absolutely. And, and against him. He's just, uh, he is, uh, Trump, I think, is somewhat more transactional where he probably doesn't really think the election is stolen from him. Maybe he's worked himself into that, but it's his cause that he's kind of got... Andrew Jackson seemed to deeply believe these right. things and like actually really thought there's corruption around every corner. It's all rigged. That's exactly right. And again, just to underscore difference, Jackson's cause is, is the nation. Um, it's not the nation as him personally. It's the nation. So, and again, he lived it out in the American Revolution and all the things that that entailed. That's a very powerful fuel cell for him as he moves forward. That second generation was so different from the founding generation where, if you study the founders like Adams, Jefferson, Washington especially, virtue and honor and some of these higher first principles matter a lot to them. Like Jefferson is, or Washington's going to be the modern day Cincinnatus. Mm -hmm. This Roman general who is called upon to save the small floundering republic and then, you know, is offered dictator for life because he wins this battle and then goes back to his farm. Washington wanted to be that guy. Everything was dispassionate. Everything was centered around service. And then came along the Jackson era where everything becomes way more personal and everything becomes um, almost like a distorted... Like the the revolution, you know, in the 1820s and 30s had, you know, kind of become commoditized. In you know, sometimes we see things that we like, like this uh, this kid with the the northern guys of Richmond. You know, the song right. that's everywhere. The guy that looks identical to me <laughs> and my brother. You know, it's we're we're two weeks on, and now it's he's become a commodity. He's become a figure for the left to hate and a figure for the right to overly embrace and. You know, it's it's not just about the pure beauty of that particular moment. So there's a lot about that second generation that really has changed. And some of the, uh, I don't know, semblance of duty and first principles has kind of worn off and become much more personal. I think that that's true. I, I, I would, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm, that this is connected, but I'm not sure that it's not connected, what I'm going to say next, which is, Another thing that's different regarding Jackson is, and we'll, we'll go to, to Washington because they're, they're really interesting figures to connect together. Very interesting figures. Jackson was anti-professional. Mm. Washington embodied the professional army in his own image. Uh, he was going to make it the world's best trained military. And that was all going to go home, but it was going to be fully trained, fully disciplined, and all the rest. That's not Jackson. Jackson is fighting West Point as much as he fights anything else, which he loves to fight. So Jackson's image is also deeply involved with place. Washington is a symbol of the Republic, capital R. Jackson is a symbol of the West. All right. And the West, in this case, means the Mississippi Valley, the Tennessee River Valley, the Ohio Valley, and, and other places like that. He is a symbol of the West, and that means rugged, that means rough, that means raw-boned. That also may mean, whether it's image or not, it means not overly 
college educated, that doesn't have that kind of pedigree. And so that in that way, he's almost anti-Washington, anti-Jefferson, anti-Adams, anti-everybody. Uh, he's a man of the West, and that's a very big part of his appeal uh, and a very big part of something that he manages to accomplish. Now, I don't know if it's in spite of himself or because of himself or some combination of self. He manages to do something that I don't think we would all see Trump as having done up to this point. And here it comes. Jackson became an ism. There is a Jacksonianism that begins to live in the early 1830s and will continue on beyond his presidency. There's certain policies, there's certain stances, as well as certain postures that are part of Jacksonianism. And I don't think I'd say there's a Trump, a Trumpism or a Trumpianism at this point. So that's a I would I for, first personally would tie that back to his cause. If there's a Trumpism, it's style. It's, it's not, not substance. It's right. not policies. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's interesting studying the beginning of Indiana. Here in 1816, we're founded as a state. Indianapolis is settled in 1821. Uh, you have uh, a strong contingent of Jacksonianism that lives on here all the way through the Civil War, for instance, where the Democrats, the Copperheads, the most pro-Southern of the Union states... Not only do we send the second most amount of troops to fight for the Union, we also uh, have uh, the Democrats take over halfway through the war, and Oliver P. Morton has to basically illegally fund the Indiana government and the war movement, you know, because of kind of that long shadow of Jacksonianism. But I think, yeah, that that uh, this doesn't maybe it does right because in the eighteen twenties, thirties, forties, you have a rejection of the founders in some ways, enough of Plato, uh, not Plato, but enough of Cicero, mm -hmm. enough of Cato. We're tired of hearing about these Greeks. This is America. This is a new frontier. This is a new West. This is a new place. There's there's this, we have the ability to create anything um, kind of building in the country. And we sort of see that parallel maybe with the internet, right. you know, where you have the ability in these new frontiers to kind of create things but there's also a little bit of the shine is worn off, right, with with maybe what was going on in the 1820s through 40s. Hey, one thing I want to mention too, Chris, because you, you set this up in our first segment, and I think it's important to come back to this. Um, and maybe we're going to say this rises to a trend, right? Because as we talk about Jackson here in my second point, as my second rapids from the river, we also need to acknowledge there is a there's a new media component to this too. Now, remember early on, that we talked about Adams Jefferson and the rise of a MSNBC and Fox versions of newspapers. Each each side has their versions. There's a there's an iteration that is something new in the Jacksonian era, and that is it's twofold. Number one is the cost has been slashed to next to nothing. That's what penny press comes. It costs a penny to go out and buy an edition of the latest newspaper. Number two. Those newspapers are going to have something else in it besides politics. They're going to have human interest. They're going to have every rumor, every half-baked report about life on the moon, for example, in, the, in 1836, I believe it is, in order to market and push and sell those newspapers for a penny each. So, so everything is sensationalized. Everything is romanticized at the same time. And that makes for a very, very volatile media environment, one that's just perfect to either chew up or elevate Andrew Jackson, as, as the case may be, and chew up and elevate whoever his opponent is, as the case may be. One thing I want to point out, I'm sorry to get wound up on No, this, you're good. Is remember that, and this is not coincidence, folks, remember impeachment. And no, it's not Nixon. No, it's not Andrew Johnson. There's another word for it, and it was censure. And who was censured? for the first time on a national basis uh, in the United States, by golly, it's Andrew Jackson. Oh, yeah, I'd forgotten that. And what does Jackson accomplish? And one thing I've talked about to people until I'm just blue in the face or red, depending on your affiliations, is one of the most important commonalities between Andrew Jackson and Donald Trump is the opposition that they produced. Their opposition goes absolutely insane. And I, I'm not, again, I'm not, making any judgment i'm just trying to describe to you the level of intensity that the opposition took so the first resistance capital r is not in 2016 or 2017 
that comes out in opposition to Donald Trump. The first resistance is what happens to uh, Andrew Jackson's opponents. Their, their political party system blows up. Yeah. The resistance was so strong, it blew up the political party system and created a new party called, that called itself the Whigs. The, 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 literally, the gestation and the birth period of that overlaps with the censure controversy that's in Congress over Jackson in 1832-1833. Lead to the Republicans or the Whigs? Leads to the Whigs. Okay, gotcha. All right. Uh, let's move on to the Republicans. Let's Absolutely. move on to 1860. Uh, I know you had it flip flopped in your presentation, but I'm gonna I'm gonna st- stay with the timeline here because yep, people get confused with Grover Cleveland and Benjamin Harrison and when they will you know Polk. I don't know when he served, right? Uh, so the total breakdown of existing political party systems, essentially, 1860 is just a wild election. Nobody really wild... knows what's going to happen. That's exactly right. It's a wild election. It's a wild campaign. Yeah, it's it's a wild set of political con- nominating conventions, which they did have at, at that period of time. And so what I've described here is you have a political party system that just completely comes undone. One party fuses, which is the Republicans. They're six years old and already fielding their second year of presidential candidates. That's remarkable growth in a short amount of time. One party fissures, which is the Democratic Party. One party melts away, which is the know nothing American Party. And one party goes extinct, which is the Whigs. So. For the second time in what we're talking about, first being Jackson, for the second time now, the political party system blows up. Now, one thing that's important about 1860, and folks, I'm not predicting this. So this is what I was very emphatic in the the, uh, presentation and the session that Chris was part of. I'm emphatic. I'm not predicting this. I'm letting you understand what are the characteristics of the breakdown of the party system in 1860. You go take those characteristics and then measure them for yourself this year and next year, and so on. So for the third time in 30 years, by 1860, you have national disunity as the top issue in a presidential campaign. This isn't the first time, it's the third time. In addition to that, and this, you have two, two opposing views of government that are entirely oppositional to each other, the expansion of slavery or the prevention of the expansion of slavery. This, this, pair of hardened positions soaks into all of the governmental structures on a federal and a state and local level. In addition, and this is the big one, underline this three times, Chris, way of life, capital W, capital O, capital F, way of, or capital L, way of life. The opposition becomes a way of life. You have two contrasting and competing and contradictory ways of life that emerge on the 1860 election map. And again, all of it is around enslavement. Now, there are other factors. I understand that. But the fundamental thing is, if you took enslavement out of this, everything would change. You can't take another factor out and say the same thing. So you have one way of life that is anti-enslavement. You have another way of life that is pro-enslavement. Those two things are not reconcilable. And so we have a molecular level of clashing about what what does self-government mean for our way of life? And this is what Lincoln is talking about. This is what Douglas is talking about and some of the other candidates as well. And so when you look at that election map, and by the way, we can put this up, show notes or wherever, um, there's a county by county breakdown of the 1860 presidential election. And it just shows you a patchwork quilt of, of voting patterns across the United States as it, as it then exists. The one trend that you'll see is that below the Mason-Dixon line, there are no counties that vote for Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. Above the above the Mason-Dixon line, that's where you'll get your Lincoln counties along with other types of counties, too. So the question I asked in our session, um, where is our division, 2023, where is our division most deeply felt and sharply seen? And again, that's not a leading question. I'm not saying, well, it's, we're on the way to civil war. That is not my point. They didn't think they were on the way to civil war during the 1860 campaign either. One side said there's going to be trouble if you if you vote for a particular candidate, that particular candidate, of course, was Abraham Lincoln. The side that said it is anybody in the South. So but nobody knew anything else beyond that. Right. So, again, where is our division most most deeply felt and sharply seen in 23 as we head into 24? That's the question from 1860. We need to ask ourselves. Yeah, I think it centers for me. And what I got out of this and my mental 
answer to this. Uh, and maybe I spoke up. I was one of three or four people that helped monopolize the time for the other 12. Um, you know, the way of life question of who are you to tell me how to live my life? Who are you to use the force of government, the inherent coercion of the state, to force me to live your way of life? And how far am I willing to go to defend my way of life, to prevent your way of life being forced on me? You know, it's that is the deepest political question, I think, right now, is how much of your vision of morality, of, uh, you know, how, usage of my money, which is, an, I think, an extension of morality, how much are you going to force me to participate in your vision? And where's my line? Right. Uh, and I think that is a rising sentiment that has always been present in the 25 years that I've paid attention to politics, but has never been more felt than it is right now. That way of life question uh, is, I think, really important for people. I think that's exactly right. And I'm older than you, just by a little bit, not by that much. But at How any rate, dare you? <laughs> I will. So I would agree with you. I mean. I, I look back and I can remember every presidential election saying, oh, this is it, man. This is all on the line now, baby. All of those things. By the way, Alexis Tocqueville, I was going to say this on our earlier segment. Alexis Tocqueville writes his, researches and writes his book, Democracy in America, when he visits Jacksonian America. Mm, okay. So he's looking and he's giving you his take on Jacksonian America. And it's a fascinating thing. So for those... Of, of your audience who are interested in an intellectual kind of deep dive into a real-time exposition and exploration of what that was like, read Democracy in America by Alexis Tocqueville. be a great way to look at it. But my point being here as we move into the, our 1860 example, and Chris will tell you I'm a word nut, so every word I write and say and, and all the rest is very carefully chosen, including the one I'm going to give to you next, which is molecular. I, I I struggled to find a word that would illustrate how deeply this went, how fundamentally this went inside of people. And I came up with the word molecules or molecular. This is a molecular question. What's my way of life and what's the government attached to that way of life? We don't have that happen very often, even aside from all of the presidential campaign BS that you hear every four years about this is the most important ever. That doesn't really happen that often. 1860 was one of those times because it's about genuinely the way of life. And so I'm asking folks, think through this, whether it's policy one, two, or three, or personality A, B, C, how does that relate to way of life? Yeah, it feels, you know, when churches are selected based on a political stance as opposed to a theological stance in 2024, we're getting to molecular levels. That's right. And Good that's example. when it starts to get dangerous. So let's move on to Grover Cleveland. All right. Uh, and talk about 1884, 88, and 1892. So remember, we had, we had, we're working with threes here to some extent, right? Three, as in the third election in 1800. Three, as in Andrew Jackson ran for president three times. And three here with Grover Cleveland, he did the same thing. Uh, and he's the only president to win. Wins his first time, loses his second time, and wins his third time. So you're telling me 2028 will be Biden versus Trump. <laughs> okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, we'll dig him up and we'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so think of it like a capital, uh, the capital letter M uh, in, in, the, uh, in the depiction of Grover Cleveland's presidential fortunes. So it's important then, win-loss-win. Win 1884, loss 1888, win 1892. There's another reason why Cleveland jumped out at me as a very significant uh, rapid from the river of the American past. And that is that from 88 to 92, it's the same matchup. So he defeats, or he loses, pardon me, he loses to Benjamin Harrison in 1888, the Republican. He wins against Benjamin Harrison, 1892, the Republican. So if Trump were to succeed, he would repeat that pattern of win, loss, win. And in the loss win half of that, or two thirds of that, it comes against the same opponent. So that's why I thought this was incredibly striking. Now, here's the, a couple of quick things here. We could spend a lot of time on this because this is a truly fascinating era, 1888 and 1892, as it relates to us. 
So in that, in that time, we're talking about populism as a major political force that's acting on both political parties. In 1888, we're talking about arguably the most corrupt presidential election in, in the American past, or if not the most, one of the three or four most corrupt. There are literally stories, documented stories, around the nation, including here in Indiana and Indianapolis, of people with, with buckets of money just passing them out to induce people to vote a particular way. We're also talking about federal spending reaching a level that was mind-boggling. No one had ever seen a million-dollar budget before. A million-dollar budget. And, but it, uh, hold on. <laughs> and there went a million dollars. And there went a million dollars. And there went a million dollars. That was the federal budget just in the last three years. That's exactly right. That, yeah, right. We can't even, right. we can't even talk that fast, right? Yeah. So, but again, in the context of the time, it was equally shocking to people at that, at that moment. There was a major national memory event. Now, we're going to have one in two and a half years with the 250th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. They had theirs in 1892, the year of the presidential election, mm -hmm. and that is um, the uh, World's Fair in Chicago, uh, which is often called the City of Light and the White City and all of that kind of thing, the 400th anniversary of Columbus. Hugely influential throughout the country. Absolutely. In, in the city design and Indianapolis, for instance, uh, the Taggart Memorial is uh, got a part of that. The way that the city is laid out now. I mean, it's the, the I think it was the Beautiful Cities Movement. I mean, is what it was called, but hugely influential in the way that most of the cities west of the Mississippi, at, from Indiana, Ohio on, were laid out because they were all really kind of getting going at that in that point. And we won't get into it, but I just want to tip you off on something, which is. Like any other major celebration, whether it's in your own life or in the nation's life, what's chosen to be celebrated or not celebrated reveals a lot. Hmm. And so that celebration in 1892 reveals a lot about the state of the American, the American electorate and the American nation at that point in time. There's also a lot of debate about great power, capital G, capital P. Is the, the United States is a great power at this point. It's become a great power. What's our responsibility? What's, what do we need to do or not do as a, in, in great power status? And then finally, we have a lot of interest in Grover Cleveland as an individual. Now, this is where we're going to see a difference here with, with Trump. Grover, Grover Cleveland pretty well kept quiet between his loss in 88 and his return in 92. He, just, he did his, he, his due diligence as a lawyer in New York City and in New York State, was a nice guy. And everybody pretty much agreed with that, regardless of what they, they believed him to be right or wrong on, on re regarding issues. Uh, was it in his loss in 88 to Harrison where it's raining and Grover Cleveland stands as Harrison gives his inaugural address and Cleveland is holding the umbrella over him as he gives the address? Was that the... I believe it is. And just a reminder, after the most corrupt election in American history, right. one of them. And he knew it. They all knew it. This wasn't news to, to them. Now, here's where we get into something really interesting for Donald Trump and for Joe Biden. So remember, Harrison and Cleveland are an interesting rhyme with Trump and Biden. Mm. Okay, so just think of of Biden as the Benjamin Harrison in this in this okay. scenario. All right, one term president seeking re-election and will lose that re-election. That's that's the Biden role in this scenario for Benjamin Harrison. Now, why did Harrison lose? There's where we get into something remarkably important for 2024. Harrison lost for two reasons. One, one of those reasons began the day of his first day in the presidency, and that is Benjamin Harrison could never overcome the divisions inside the Republican Party. Uh. He never could, and it killed him. It absolutely killed his political fortunes. It was, a, it was an albatross. It was a barrier. Every day of his presidency, he had to deal with that fact. What were they based around? Oh, it's based around he was a good government guy. He was never the kind of person who liked the back deals, the, the smoking, or not the smoking, the smoke-filled rooms and, and all of those kinds of things. He was always more of a, let's do it for virtue's sake, let's do it for honor's sake, the nation's sake. That was how he thought government ought to be, ought to be run. Now, there's exceptions to that for his, his policies, but by and large, that was exactly how he viewed public service on every single level that he served in, including in the White House. However, 
Every member of his cabinet is representative of some political constituency who's looking to horse trade today or mule trade tomorrow. And it just drives Harrison nuts. And he could never get everybody elevated up to what he thought was a unified level. And it was he he failed down the road on that, just down the road. So that was one reason why he's going to lose in, in 92. But here's the bigger reason. And this is where we get to 2023, 2024. Personal. There was a there was a devastatingly personal tragedy for Benjamin Harrison. Devastating. And here it is. And some of you may know where I'm going. I think it's a month before the election. So we're talking September, early October. His wife falls deathly ill. She's, she's always had health problems. This is Caroline. They called her Carrie. She's always had health problems, but this time it's tuberculosis and it's fatal. And she's dead. She's dead four to five weeks, I think it is, ahead of the, of the actual election day. That, you might as well have cut off both arms. Yeah. The guy goes into a, a mental tailspin, Benjamin Harrison, and essentially stops campaigning. Grover Cleveland stopped campaigning, too. That's exactly expect, right. Yeah. Again, another kind of gentleman's agreement here. It's like the umbrella, right, from four years before. I've often said, and I'm not trying to be offensive, I think it would have been, it would have been easier for Harrison to have dealt with the death of, a ch- of his child than it would have been the death of his wife. They were inseparable. Yeah. And so when that personal factor was introduced, the race was done. And, it, and, and Cleveland goes on to his victory. Here's how it applies today as, again, you use your measurements, you mark it out. What would be the equivalent of a personal impact, a personal factor in 2023, 2024? Now we know, I'll just say this outright and, and forgive me here. We know that Joseph Biden is in a very difficult, a very different physical and mental condition than he was four years ago, and certainly than he was eight years ago. Go watch anything with him as vice president. It's it's sort of shocking. The we were talking about this earlier, and I only you know half joked that it he looks like Iron Man by comparison. Yeah, so you you don't have to. I think it's not partisan. It should just be an honest assessment of the man's faculties at this point. And you know what? We've all lived this, right? We've all had relatives who, at eighty some years old, one person was in fabulous shape and the other person's in horrible shape. Yeah. And so it just affects different people in different ways. So what would be the personal equivalent? of a rhyming rapid from 1892 and 2023 and 2024. And it doesn't have to be death. Obviously, death is the ultimate personal equivalent, but it could be, frankly, just debilitation. Well, I'm, I'm reading this book called Laptop from Hell About Hunter uh, because I don't know anything about the Hunter stuff. I've never covered it on the show. I never really like paid attention to it because to me it was sort of like Billy Carter or you know, Roger Clinton, just sort of like irrelevant type stuff. But then you start to like, oh, there's more to the story and maybe it involves the president. Uh, And what you what you get from the the texts in the laptop that this book is kind of illustrating is how deeply this man loves his son, how deeply he loves his grandkids, uh, how deeply uh, I mean, the family man thing is not overblown. I know the, the seventh grandkid thing is unfortunate. Um, and out of character for him. But I could see, you know, the Hunter thing maybe taking a turn for the worse, uh, and maybe that really distracting him. Maybe that re- that really throws him off, and somehow that could be the rhyme here, is that his son going through prosecution and trial and, and, and all of that just, it wears on him even more than the weight of the presidency. It very well could. And again, I go back to at least my experiences and... and perhaps other people who are listening to me, including you, Chris, when you reach, when a certain person reaches a certain age and things happen to them, the impact can be much different than than if it had happened 20 years before. That resiliency of losing his son and wife in the 70s doesn't have the same, he doesn't have the same bounce back. It can be all consuming. It can be all engulfing in that regard. So there are there are more there's more than one way that personal, capital P personal as a factor, can completely overturn the uh, or affect and dominate uh, a presidential campaign like the one that happened with Benjamin Harrison and potentially the one that could happen with uh, Joe Biden. Fun fact, I go to Benjamin Harrison's church. Redeemer Presbyterian is uh the church that uh, Benjamin Harrison went to, you're you're really uh, plugged in at the Benjamin Harrison house, which is a block south, two blocks south. Uh, if you're in Indy, Indiana, and you're not a you know 
You probably went when you were in fourth grade, but go to the Benjamin Harrison house and uh, celebrate Indiana's president. Uh, so I, I think we have to address the uncomfortable nature we have a little bit when it comes to Biden. I think Trump obviously is probably not the physically healthiest person. Correct. Uh, not maybe the mentally healthiest person. I think there he's he's up there as well. He he seems to have a little more energy. But obviously, the, I, I uh, these are my sentiments, not Dan's. You know, uh, their uh, their age is playing out in different ways, but in equally concerning measures uh, when it comes to Trump and Biden. And they're just they're they're elderly. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Um, so what would happen if one of those two candidates might pass away? History has an answer. What election are we going to talk about? Here we go, man. And again, just to preface for folks, as we get into the fifth and final segment here, the fifth and final rapids from the from the river, um, it can mean death. It can mean mean other things too. But look at look at Woodrow Wilson. Exactly. Exactly. Right? exactly. So let's go to August second, nineteen twenty three, seven twenty in the evening in San Francisco, California, and the last words that POTUS. Warren G. Harding says to a colleague is, quote, that's good. Go on, close quote. And he'll be dead approximately 15 minutes later. Uh, he collapses from a from a heart condition uh, during a 15,000 mile presidential campaign, not campaign so much, but just kind of public communication event called the Voyage of Understanding. He'll be the first president to seek to go to the Alaska Territory, for example. Well, he dies on August 2nd. Uh, in the evening, California time, and the first person to come out and inform the public is the Secretary of Commerce, a young man by the name of Herbert Hoover, who releases a public statement that says cerebral apoplexy is the cause of the president's death. And by 2.43 a.m. Vermont time, the following early morning, Vice President Calvin Coolidge is sworn in, I believe it's by his father, as a local justice of the peace, as President of the United States, Coolidge having been Harding's vice president. And, and in, a, in a fact that is gigantic in its symbolic and substantive meaning, Calvin Coolidge's next decision tells us an awful lot, which is he goes back to bed. <laughs> so instead of the national calamity atmosphere that would probably be true in 2023, 2024, or many other years too, Calvin Coolidge pulls the covers up and uh, waits until morning to begin thinking about what will happen next. So this is a real-time example of a vice president taking over the reins, and it's an absolutely fascinating way to think about rhyming of the river uh, from 1923-24 down to 2023-24. So just a couple of little facts here, Chris, that folks might not know, might interest them. Uh, Harding's body goes on display for a four-day period, uh, for the rest of that week on the same funeral platform um, that, that was used for Abraham Lincoln. That was very purposeful. Uh, they're both Republicans, by the way. That was very purposeful as a way of symbolizing kind of national continuity and, and all of that kind of thing. And so, but what immediately becomes true is that there's a media, M-E-D-I-A, there's a media frenzy around Calvin Coolidge. And we don't think of any of this being the case. You think of the kind of, you know, the roaring 20s and the dull 20s and the this and that 20s. Well, there's a media frenzy that starts in the late summer of 23, and everybody demands to know as much as they possibly can about Calvin Coolidge the person, Calvin Coolidge the human being. So every newspaper is just stuffed with human interest stories about Calvin Coolidge uh, from August to December of 1923. Now, Coolidge is going to begin, now listen to this, again, think of the stereotypes that you've got in your head from uh, whatever god-awful class you took in high school or college about the 1920s or modern America history. Um, Coolidge starts what will become a monthly average of eight press conferences per month as the new president going through the, uh, the, the next election. This thing, eight, conf- eight press conferences a month, that's two a week. Which is... In, yeah, Barack Obama didn't even come close. That's amazing. It's, it's incredible. He also starts this, this daily, nightly slew of visitors that come into the White House to have dinner and lunch, maybe sleep overnight. And the reason he does that is he's trying to get 
his his image out into the public because he knows the media will coverage will cover every single visitor who comes in. And so when when the visitors come out for their interviews, what was it like? What's he like? Blah, blah, blah. What's up going on? Everybody says kind of the same thing. The guy's unbelievably funny. Yeah. He's unbelievably hospitable and generous as a host. And it was just a lot of fun to hang out with the guy. Was it was it hit? Was it because he was better in person and he knew that he wasn't necessarily going to shine through on on camera, so to speak? And so he was doing it. I, I can't remember if he was the president that was doing this because he knew he was really good one on one, and that was sort of his strategy. This is this is the strategy. This is exactly the strategy. He knows who he is. Uh, he knows kind of how he's been covered up to this point. And remember, there is a national media at this point. There are national newspapers, national magazines, and other. There's radio stations for Pete's sake. So he know he's aware of how he comes across. So he he believes and knows that if I take this tack. If I go this direction, my odds go up, my chances go up of people seeing the real me. And by the way, there's a quote from a from an observer in one one part of the media quote. It's refreshing in these days of blase Americanism, close quote, to see a guy like Calvin Coolidge. And so what blase Americanism feels like in this in this phrase, by the way, is a hyper interest in the latest fashion, the latest trend, the latest crazy kind of 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 antics that's all over the country at this point. And they, they just like seeing a guy like Coolidge who seems to be anti all of that. Um, so here's a couple of things that are going on for the rest of in the rest of that year. So remember, late summer, fall and into the early winter. Uh, in the f- final months of um, 1923. There's an off-year election in Vermont that everybody's tracking very closely uh, to see how, what does it reflect about Calvin Coolidge. There's a, there's a primary in South Dakota. Listen to that, primary, presidential primary in South Dakota. It's very modern. Yeah, extremely yeah. modern. Oh, what's it say about Calvin Coolidge and where are we headed? There's a, there's a poll about the president, presidential election for the following year. There's, there's a lot of anger on the pro- Coolidge side about we're not getting fair treatment from the media even with all these wonderful visits we're still not getting fair treatment from the media there's a belief too that there, that the coming election next year's election remember next year's election is going to be more about principles than personality isn't that an interesting thing and then finally there's a statement in one newspaper that says the honeymoon is over the honeymoon with with now president Calvin Calvin Coolidge is effectively over and then his first public statement. Now, this you can, we won't go as far with this as maybe we could over a beer or a glass of wine or something. But his first public statement is the annual message. Now, that used to be that that's our State of the Union. Right. In his era, it was delivered in December of a calendar year. So his annual message is his first formal speech as the new president of the United States. And remember, he's taken office back in August. Isn't that an interesting? thing to consider relative to 2023 yeah, you, 2024 the second the second that there was a pronouncement i mean you look, look at lbj for instance lbj was on the plane insisted on being on the plane swearing in there gets sworn in twice once as a photo op with jackie kennedy standing next to him and basically a extremely crass political move because he understands the owner of television stations understands the importance of imagery, messaging, stri- you know, strategy. Whereas exactly. 40 years before that, this guy is waiting four months to give a speech. <laughs> That's kind of insane. It is. It is. So I'll give you three things just to keep in mind as your measurements from 1923-24. Number one, he goes to bed, you know, that night that he gets sworn in. Number two is there's this really orchestrated and very carefully thought out personal campaign of of personality that he's trying to get across and the number three is this speech and i've given i've i've politely asked people to read one thing already which is democracy in america well after that that's kind of a load so just yeah, hang right. on in there so I mean, the speech first and then the yeah, 500 people, right. yeah. so here, here's something short get on the internet and look up calvin coolidge's annual message december 1923 and you'll be amazed at what what that speech looks like and again ask yourself how does that measure up against what might be our version if that were to happen today? So here's something that's from the first paragraph. Quote, referring to Harding, quote, he is gone, we remain, close quote. Flat, direct, business, business as usual, let's all move on. That's a remarkable statement. The other thing that's it's so important about this 
is the second main point of the entire speech, and it's lengthy, but it's really interesting. The second main point in 1923, everybody, it's about Russia. Huh. So we, again, put on your, your 1920s assumption glasses, and you're assuming it's all about good times and everything else. His second thing that he wants to talk about in his first major address is Russia. I found that a quite interesting thing. Now, last thing about this. You go through this speech, and you're going to see peppered through here the following kinds of statement. My stand on this policy is blank. I favor blank. I believe blank. I do propose or do not propose blank. American policy is blank. These are declarative statements. Yeah. None of this is focus group. None of this is kind of mealy mouth or wishy washy. It's directive. It's straight on. And that's Calvin Coolidge. And again, that's probably not going to be your first assumption as to what happened with this particular POTUS four months after having taken office. So you never know. That's my point. And by the way, the, one of the last lines, the next to the last line, I'm going to quote to you and then I'll be quiet. Quote, America has taken her place in the world as a republic, free, independent, powerful. Close quote. Yeah, that, and I see why Amity Schles wrote a great book on him and why so many libertarians can stomach him because he stands on principle. Um, I think the interesting thing about this story that stands out is the, the different reactions a hundred years ago that society had, or at least what we can see, right? We don't know what maybe was happening in the, the beer hall in downtown Indianapolis or Deadwood, South Dakota, um, but which I'm rewatching now, full of graph, um, just corrupt government officials from the beginning. Um, the you I don't know how many people the deep state employ. But it has to, at some point, if you're a conspiracy theorist type, you have to wonder how many people do they actually employ because every single week they're involved in something. Like, we're at, like, 574 deep state takeover action false flags at this point, right? Like, if if one of these candidates passed away, how much of the country wouldn't believe that it was just a regular coronary attack? You know what I mean? Like, it was... The, the difference between that that four-day lag of him being buried and then a four-month lag between his speech and, you know, they, they just sort of, well, I guess we'll believe Herbert Hoover when he makes up this word apoplexy, right? Like, which maybe meant stroke back then, and I don't know it, but uh, I, I just can't imagine the nightmare that it would be if one of these candidates passed away now. There wouldn't be that... Uh, I'm not going to say it was civil because I don't know. Anytime I think, oh, the past was so much more civilized, I then go read the past and I go, oh, we're way better. Um, but I would think that would be the thing that stood out to me the most is that if Biden or Trump were to pass away or become debilitated in some way, it it, it almost would be the conspiracy around it would be the thing more than the situation that, that we're in. Okay, you paid me a great compliment early on in our segment today. And I, if I didn't thank you then, I'll thank you now, which yeah. is you said some words to the effect that um, Dan can help kind of calm everything down yeah. to some extent, right? History has shown us, the past has shown us, et cetera. Well, thank you for another reason, because you just jogged my memory about something I said in our session about this very point, which is, and there's a further point to be made here. It only took a couple of years in the mid-1920s, 27 or so, 28. It only took a couple of years before the conspiracy theories began. Okay. And the, and the conspiracies were, the theories were that Harding's wife had killed him. Uh, okay. And because she was a very uh, magnetic and polarizing figure. I'm not putting it past Milani. <laughs> He's been through a lot. <laughs> so isn't it? So, and here's my point. What I think the primary, one of the primary effects of our media technology today. Remember, we talked about the penny press and the various changes in the media. By the way, we've got radio now. We have motion pictures yeah. in the 1920s. That's very important. Motion pictures. But one of the primary effects of our version of this in the 2020s is that is compression. So it's not that it won't happen. It happened four years afterwards in 1927 with the Florence Harding conspiracy. It'll happen four minutes afterwards here. It's just compressed. It's the same thing, but it's compressed. And so the fact that it's 
that it happens isn't a surprising thing, it being the theory of conspiracy. Yeah. But the fact that it happens so rapidly is, is our burden to bear. I think one of the interesting things post-COVID is COVID built these networks that had kind of, it didn't build them. They were already building. But COVID gave new substance and more people involved in like information channels. So if something happens, I forget what the thing the you know, the, the latest thing that if you read the New York times and believed that you're an idiot, because this is the actual truth thing that you really like, if something happens, you've got about a, like, a, like let's say a, a shooting happens and it's kind of top of the, the mind news. You've got about a four day window before, it floats to the top what the official unofficial story is, right? Like, so the, so COVID kind of helped create or, or grow these channels of alternative information where I'm not going to say it's always wrong. I'm not going to say that there aren't times where I go, yeah, that seems pretty plausible. But you take something like the Vegas shooting, for instance. Um, well, here's a guy who just is distraught has a bunch of guns in his hotel room and then decides to shoot, become the deadliest mass shooter in history. Takes about four days for him to become a guy who's involved in Fast and Furious and he's selling guns to ISIS and they're the ones that kill him and then they shoot out the window, right? Like, you you do have a period, a brief period, where the official story stands before these, like, information channels sort of settle on one theory and then it becomes the alternative theory. And then within a month, you have Glenn Beck, Ben Shapiro kind of entertaining it, right? Like, uh, it, you know, and it, it happens on the left, too. If it's a right-leaning story that benefits the right, well, like, oh, well, this kid who plays the steel guitar and sings about fudge rounds, he's not a real musician. He's a guy that's astroturfed and has blah, blah, blah. They have their own version of it, right? Just seems to be the th an interesting observation that I've seen that it does sort of settle a few days afterwards. It's maybe not immediate. Maybe immediately they all start going to work trying to, you know, determine this is the real shooter, and then they get the guy wrong, and that person jumps off a bridge, right? Like, so it, it's just you have to be so careful with it. I, I do listen to it. I do follow all the conspiracies, you know, just by virtue of having a libertarian feed, just to kind of see what people say and and the information that they arrive at and how, how it almost is at a point where the fringes on the left and right have their official, unofficial story. And you can't really deviate from that story and poke holes at it or else you're a moderate, which to an extremist is way worse than anything else. Like you, you they, they can accept you being a commie if you're a, a far right libertarian, right? But they... God help you if you're a squishy libertarian, right? So it's it, these information channels do exist, and it it would be quite unpleasant, I think, if we got to that situation. But maybe it wouldn't be unpleasant. We're just this is the new normal. You're just always going to have alternative stories. You know, one thing that's you, that's and you very, always did. It's very well said. I two things. Um, one is that yeah, yeah, we're that. Um, the burden on us, us being Americans, 23 going forward, as leaders, if you have one or more followers, you're a leader in my book, is not the burden of action. It's the burden of inaction. Yeah. It's, it's the responsibility to not do the knee jerk, but to, but to insert time, insert space, insert patience and some deliberation before you make your major action. Yeah. And that may be a speech, a remark, a post, or whatever the case may be. And you'll never get credit for that. You'll, nobody will ever say, boy, I'm really glad he, he or she dragged his feet and then came out later. Um, you'll never get credit for that. But, but I think that's, that's a very important component of leadership in the first third of the 21st century is to resist the siren call of immediate action. Last comment is uh, Benjamin Harrison. Go back to him. When, the, when Fort Sumter was fired on. Fort Sumter fell and surrendered and all the rest, April of 1861. It's 16 months later before Benjamin Harrison raises his hand to volunteer. Mm. And I would argue, and I've argued this with clients, that that is a tremendous leadership thing. 
because there were rumors and all kinds of things in that 16 months, innuendos and everything else. Um, and Harrison waited and waited and waited, and then it got to the point where he thought, this is, this is it. This is it. 16 months later, in early July of 1862, this is it. Raises his hand and volunteers to, uh, to take a command role in it as a lieutenant colonel. So I think that's an important lesson for 2023 and beyond is take your time. Take your time. We used to do a lot of hot takes immediately about things we didn't know here on the program, and now we uh, well, I'm still working on that indictment show. Taking my time. Uh, Dan Miller, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. All right, and thank you, listener, for joining us here. Make sure you go and sign up at Dan's website, uh, which will be in the show notes. Look up Historical Solutions, get on his email list, and you can come and attend to great events that he does like this. Follow him on social media. Again, we'll have those in the show notes. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this, if you learned something, please share it with your friends. That's the best way to help content creators like Dan, like myself. And thank you for listening here on The Chris Spangle Show. This podcast was produced and edited by Chris Spangle and Leaders and Legends, LLC. If you're interested in starting a podcast or taking yours to the next level, please contact us at leadersandlegends.net.